the sketch Mindist. I'm Jeff Phillips at the University of Utah, and this is joint work with Ping Fontaine, who recently uh, finished his PhD and is and is now at, and is now at Google. So th this is a talk about distances between shapes, right? So there there are many distances between shapes in various forms. It could be piecewise linear curves or general closed sets or, or just point sets. These include the Hausdorff distance, Fréchet distance, dynamic time warping, Wasserstein distance, kernel distance, turning curve distance, and many, many, many more. This talk is about one more distance between shapes. Um, so, okay, so, so why do we want to study distances between shapes? Why are these important? Well, you know, it's important to understand the notion of shape, right? A distance tells you what is important for whether two shapes are similar or not. And these different kind of definitions give you model different real world properties about the shapes, right? So there are all these different definitions. One, because, you know, they're interesting to worry about trying to, how do you compute them efficiently and um, what are the mathematical properties? Um, but but um, also they can tell you, capture different things that are useful in the analysis of the un, some real world issue. Um, you know, th these come up, there are two kind of um, clear um, applications. One is these shape databases where you have lots and lots of shapes. They could be from drawings or outlines of images or, or kind of or sets of trajectories or 3D CAD models. And you want to have a query and quickly retrieve all the ones which are similar to this. A nearest neighbor can then sort of query. And then the notion of distance you do, um, you use determines which ones are similar. And if you have a lot of shapes, you want this to be efficient. Um, you might also want to learn something about or from the shapes. So let's say you you have a bunch, huge number of shapes, and you are able to label some. Some mean good or bad or, or have to do with life or death. And you want to use those labeled ones to predict the properties of new ones that you don't have labels for. This is, is machine learning. How can we do machine learning on shapes, right? Um, so, so in machine learning in particular, there's kind of this hierarchy of, of, of properties, and I've kind of simplified it here. But you know, if something is a is a, if the distance is a is a, is a, is a metric, it gives you certain properties. It gives you access to certain algorithms, such as um, say case interclustering algorithms work for for any sort of metric, right? Um, if you have an an inner product in a reproducing kernel Hilbert space, right? Then all of the kernel tricks uh, you may have heard of from, from machine learning just, just automatically work, right? They allow you to have this um, convex convergence in your gradient descent algorithms. And, and you can just, if, if, if they call worse about the inner product, you get all these nice properties. What's even nicer is if there's some Euclidean representation. You basically represent things as some vector, use Euclidean distance, then basically all of machine learning works just out of the box. I can, I can take my vectors and turn on scikit-learn and Python and just run any algorithm I'm interested in, in running. K-means clustering works as well as kind of, um, you know, um, kernel SVM, but also kind of oh, like decision trees and anything else you want to do, right? So there's this kind of hierarchy of distance that are nice mathematical properties, okay. So, so this is distances between shapes. So what is the Mindis sketch, right? And how does this relate? Okay, so we're gonna start with the shape and I'll use as an example a piecewise linear curve here, the shape J. And so to define this, we need to define a set of landmarks Q. Okay, this is a set Q of points that live in the same domain as the shape. So they're both in say RD. Okay, and then for each point QI, like the one labeled here, you know, I'm going to take the minimum distance onto the shape, the, the mindis. So I'll call this VI. And there's the closest point P on the shape. And I record the distance between QI and P as this value VI. Okay, and I do this for all of the landmarks. There, are, I can label them and order them from 1 to N. And I get N of these values, these positive values. And I'm going to get this vector. I get this n-dimensional vector. This is my sketch of the shape. This is, this is the Mindis sketch. So any shape here, 
I can then take a bunch of, uh, of these, the, these fixed landmark points and it, that generates this vectorized sketch. Okay, I like to interpret this as you can think of this shape as emanating this distance function. So as I get further away from this from the shape, I'm um, kind of I see these isolines coming out, and there's this kind of this function that fills R D based on the distance from the shape. And then if I have a different shape, so this is another piece of linear curve now J prime. I use the same landmarks where I'm basically querying this distance min disk function, and I get a different vector, okay? And then given these two shapes, the distance between them is actually, for a fixed set Q, is just going to be this um, the Euclidean distance between these vectorized representations, these sketches. Okay, so, so that's the distance. So the, the idea is I throw down these fixed landmarks, and then for any shape, I create these sketch vectors, and I use the Euclidean distance between the shapes. Okay, the advantage is I get this Euclidean vectorized representation, and everything downstream is easy. So, so Pink Fan and I had a paper that introduced this in Sig Spatial 2019, and we showed that kind of, um, one, you can really easily do stuff like K-means clustering, for you can run a bunch of um, machine learning algorithms um, on top of this and compare it with KNN algorithms for other distances and on a bunch of, uh, of trajectory classification tasks, this performs as well or in some cases much better than, than, than all, these, all these other algorithms. So it was a little bit surprising, but it, you know, it actually, actually worked pretty well. Um, this was just with 20 landmarks randomly chosen. And also um, for nearest neighbor queries, um, this is incredibly fast because we have been, turns out, engineering things like um, LSH for Euclidean distance. For Frechet distance, this is now, there's some techniques, but they're, they're much harder to do. Um, once you have these Euclidean vectors, everything is super, super easy and super efficient. There can be several five or so orders of magnitude faster than, than kind of nearest neighbor queries for other sorts of shapes. So, so, so this is a really easy to use and really powerful technique. Okay, so this talk, um, is about how do we select the point set Q, right? How many points Q do we need and how should we select it so this does a good job? That's what this is going to be talking about. Okay, so um, let's start, we'll start with different, we'll think of different sort of shapes and we'll get some, some different properties. So first we're gonna start with um, just oriented hyperplanes in RD. So let the two shapes we're considering being these oriented hyperplanes. Um, and these can be defined by a normal vector and an offset from the origin, right? So then for a point QI, when it's an oriented hyperplane, I get a signed distance now, um, just by taking the dot product with the normal with QI and, and subtracting what the, what the offset is. This gives me this signed distance, um, okay? Um, and so it turns out this means I can encode a um, half space, half planes in D dimensions with a D plus one dimensional vector, and it's basically a vector space over these, right? So even if I have a lot of these, um, these, these landmarks, there's a span of only D plus one of them, which really captures um, in this even n dimensional vector space, which captures everything that's going on. And so th this fits really well, turns out, with this sensitivity sampling framework of uh, Langberg, Schulman, and Feldman. Um, and so, so, so this, th this allows um, us to kind of um, use some very powerful techniques to kind of figure out how to subsample any point set Q. Basically, I can subsample Q to Q tilde with D plus one over um, delta epsilon squared points. And then with probably one minus delta, for that um, pair of, of, um, of, of half planes, the distance is one plus epsilon approximated um, using just this sample. There's some details about the weights and so forth that, that are now pretty standard. I'm going to skip over. Okay, but in this setting with half spaces, it turns out it fits really well in the sensitivity sampling framework. That I, it, it's important that you can represent this in a vector space because then the difference, I need to worry about the difference between two objects, and that difference also lives in the vector space. Okay. Whereas in typically the sensitivity sampling framework had not been used on the difference between two objects, just on recovering a single object instead. Okay, 
So, okay, so let's move on to kind of jump to more general setting where we're talking about just bounded closed sets. Okay, so now we're considering two shapes, the red one and the green one, J and J prime. And um, unfortunately, if we don't say there's something nice like a half plane, then the total sensitivity may be unbounded. Um, and this basically governs how many points we need to sample to ensure that the distance can be um, approximated um, with any accuracy by, say, subsampling Q or selecting Q from some kind of arbitrarily big initial set. Okay, so, um, in, in, you know, and basically the total sensitivity over epsilon squared is roughly the number of samples that, that we would need here. Um, okay, so, so to do this, we introduce these two new kind of parameters. Um, one is L, which is saying there's some domain where all of the landmark points Q and the shapes must lie in, and the diameter of, the, of this domain is L. And another parameter, rho, which says that all pairs of distances we'll consider will be at least a distance rho apart. Um, otherwise, we can say, well, well, we won't say things are zero, we'll say they're rho or some details like that. Okay, so I have these two parameters, and you can, and you can with some fairly not too complicated packing and, um, and counting arguments, you can show that the total sensitivity um, might need to be as, as large as L over rho, but does not need to be larger than L over rho squared. Okay, so, and I'm not gonna go through these fairly uh, straightforward arguments, but the total sensitivity turns out to be tied to these two parameters, L and, and rho, where L is the diameter of the domain, rho is the minimum distance between the two shapes under this our choice of dq distance. Okay, so we can improve the total sensitivity though um, with some more careful analysis, and this is kind of the technical bulk of the paper, um, to, to something that looks pretty close um, to, <laughs> pretty close to just L over rho. Okay, so um, in, in, in two dimensions, this is basically L over rho times these terms, which in the Worst case is a, another L over rho term, which is the old upper bound, but in most cases is, um, is, has some logarithmic, either in the number of initial landmarks or in the L over the minimum distance between any of the two distinct landmark points. Okay, um, another thing we can say is if instead we said, okay, the, the initial Q set, a reasonable choice would be that it's uniform over this domain. Then in that case, again, the total sensitivity is L over rho of 2 to the d over 2 plus d, which is, in two dimensions is going to be exactly L over rho, which is optimal. Okay, so, so if we know the right result if it's uniform or basically any sufficiently kind of uniform grid or something like that, then this argument can work. Okay, so I'll give you a little bit taste of how this main technical result works. And the idea is we have to bound this total sensitivity um, of the point set Q, right? And again, remember, if the point set Q is really uniform, we know what the result is, but if it might be something kind of exotic, we may not be able to bound it. And in that case, different points, you might want to sample with a higher probability into, the, into your subset, right? And this is what sensitivity sampling does. And to kind of understand how the sensitivity is, um, we do it, this, there's the CQ term, which, which we, we created, which, which is, is really tied to the sensitivity of the individual point. And this is defined by taking a point, this, this point Q, um, for instance, the point Q here at the middle, and drawing a L infinity ball around it of radius R. And you want to find a ball that has a large radius, the maximum radius without too many points in it. Right, so it's this expression you want to maximize over all choice of radii um, up to basically L, um, so that the it's basically the, the radius is large, but the number of points um, inside of it is not too large, right? And you want to find the maximum of this term. And this basically controls the sensitivity of that point. Then the total sensitivity basically corresponds with something like this C uppercase Q, which is the average to the 2 over 2 to the d. So average of, in 2d, the square root of each of these, um, of the, each of these individual terms. And, and the, that basically governs what the total sensitivity is. 
Um, and so um, we we're basically able to balance C uppercase Q um, to these 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 logarithmic terms. Um, in the general case and in the uniform case, we can show this is constant. Um, our conjecture is that the C uppercase Q is actually always constant, but we weren't quite able to able to prove that. Um, okay. Um, okay, so we can also do a little bit better if we specify the complexity of the shape in some other way, right? So for instance, we looked at piecewise linear curves with k and most k pieces. This could be, this generally would work for piecewise linear curves with, or polygons with at most k pieces, and, or you know, some other stuff like that instead. Um, and, and so these would have um, k plus one different kind of critical points. And then what is important to understand is we need to worry about the difference between two curves. So let's say you have j and j prime here, and you need to find this function for any point qi if I queried this domain, I want to look at the difference between their min distance functions and square that. And I want to understand the complexity of this function. This is what is end up going to be tied to this sensitivity sampling framework. Um, and to do this, I want to look at the range space defined by this function where I say I, for two particular shapes and some parameter, um, this um, kind of I want to say, what are all the points Q, which for these two shapes, the squared difference of their distance function is less than tau, right? This defines a, a subset of RD, and this defines a range space over Q for any pair of shapes, right? And so we can show that the shattering dimension, basically roughly like the VC dimension, is, is uh, K cubed for this shape for any constant D. Um, and that this allows us to use what's called a strong corset um, or a strong notion of sensitivity sampling. That basically I get the same total sensitivity over epsilon squared term, but if I do an extra k cubed log of the total sensitivity sampling, then I'm going to ensure not just for one pair of these shapes, but for all shapes, I'm going to get one plus epsilon approximation. And this is really useful if I'm running a machine learning or data analysis algorithm. I might be making multiple comparisons. I don't need to worry about the union bound, um, the probability of failure over one of them at, at this point. Okay. Um, okay, so, so this gives me a slightly better bound. Um, okay, finally, one last result is to show the power of the sketch is that you can actually reconstruct curves from just the sketch. So we, can, we showed this with just curves. We, called with at most k pieces, um, and they're so-called tau separated. So any critical point is further away from tau from any other critical point. So these disks around the critical points will always be empty, and the angles are always non-zero. Um, we're really just looking at the shape of the curve. So if it doubles back in itself, or there's some ambiguity in which you know how the connectivity goes, um, we, we don't want to deal with that sort of issue. Okay, so then if Q is sufficiently dense, and think of a sufficiently dense grid, for instance, then we can actually reconstruct the, um, the shape from just the sketch vector exactly, right? It's not approximately recovered. We can recover it exactly. Okay, and the, the algorithm is, is fairly simple. For each of the, um, of the landmark points Q, we can check, we can use... Um, a constant number of the neighbors to check if it's near one of the of the critical points. And for all the ones which are near a critical point, we can then actually recover that critical point exactly. This is a fairly technical case analysis. Here's an uh, example picture from it. I won't go through, but you can kind of see how it carves out these empty circles and you can use this to recover where the exact critical point is. Then once we have all these critical points, we can kind of figure out, okay, there's a vector of possible directions from each of these and figure out the ordering of them and then recover the curve from kind of stringing these together in order in basically linear time and the number of the landmark points plus k squared time for the number of critical points. Okay, so, so it's a very powerful representation as it, as, as it turns out. Okay, so ju just to summarize, this Mindis sketch gives you this vectorized representation of, um, of um, of any sort of shape you have. It makes it very useful for nearest neighbor searching. 
um, and any sort of learning um, or data analysis under the curves. Um, and in, in this talk, we showed that, you know, how to choose or how to think about how to take a subset of the, of the number of the landmarks you need to define this distance and, it, and how it gives you an approximation of this Mindus function, which shows up in a lot of other places in geometry, such as shape reconstruction and competition topology. All right, so I will, I will stop there.